you know, whenever I do something, my actions have consequences that are all over the place. I mean, there's, there's outcomes that are good, there's outcomes that are bad, there's just all sorts of stuff coming up. So, you know in physics, like, people are always dropping feathers in vacuums. <laughs> really? Come on. So, in moral theology, people have actions that have only two outcomes. This is the feather in the vacuum. So, imagine a scenario in which an action has one good outcome and one bad outcome. And you've got to decide whether to do this action or not. So, you've got this action. This stuff. And so the question is, in the simplified version, you have an act with a double effect. One good, one bad. That's kind of that's where the name of this thing comes from. So the question then is, you've got to choose whether to act or not. How do you decide? If I do this, this good thing will happen and this bad thing will happen. Do I do this or not? You've got to make a choice. It's a binary decision. So here's how, with a bunch of chewing on this, uh, here's how this comes out. So, <laughs> this is a side comment. There's a, I don't know if you guys have come across him, and Senior Brockman, he's the, the vicar general for the diocese. I was uh, listening to him give a talk a few years ago, and he's very funny. He, uh, he said, well, this is a peculiar, I'm not doing this, uh, it's an interesting way of speaking. He said, you know, the Catholic Church, we have a long tradition of our thinking being well married. So we got 2,000 <laughs> years of thinking about things. And so here's what's percolated through. At this point, I think it took about 1,700 years for this. <laughs> the principle of double effect has four criteria. If you want to memorize something, here's something you can memorize. So the principle of double effect, in order to choose to do this action, here's the example. I drove over here tonight to give a talk. The good outcome of the talk, hopefully, is you know formation and inspiration and drawing you closer to God. The bad outcome is I have contributed to greenhouse gases because I burned some gas here. So, good outcome, bad outcome. Do I decide to come or not? Okay. Here's how you think through it. So, if I'm going to decide to drive over here or do any action with good and bad consequences, principle number one: what it is that I'm doing has to be good. I mean, if I'm choosing to do an evil action, this whole thing just stops right there. So I have to be doing a good action starting, right? So then the second thing is my intention must be only for the good outcome. So if I'm intending the bad outcome, that identifies in me a disordered will. I am wanting something bad to happen. And that's bad. So I can only intend that the good outcome happens. The third principle is that the good outcome must not be a consequence of the bad outcome. That sounds a little abstract. In driving over here, if you know, if I intend, I'm going to get the ozone layer. I'm going to, I'm going to greenhouse gas this planet as quick as I can. And I'm choosing evil. Okay. Now, if in coming over here, the fact that I have polluted the atmosphere through gasoline. If that somehow makes a good thing happen, then I'm, what am I doing? Using evil to accomplish good. So that's where this principle comes from. So the good thing that you want to accomplish has to be a direct outcome of your action. It must not be a consequence of the bad outcome. Does that make sense? So when, later when we get to some examples, I think they'll be a little more apparent. I hope it's not too attractive. Actually, let me ask it this way. For anybody, are you just like, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, okay, good. Um, and then the last one is this. This is the, the, the notion that the good that you're going to accomplish has to be proportionate to the evil. So this is where prudential judgment, prudence, you know, the, 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 the virtue of prudence. Um, this is where it comes from. You've you, you got to be able to judge well. You have to have a well-formed conscience to be able to weigh out, is this worth it? Is this what I want to do? And this is where prayer comes in and listening to the voice of God. It's a really big decision. Well, anyway, but I mean, if you have to be very explicit in thinking through it, prayer should be part of it. So that's the principle of double effect. Does that make sense? Um, so let me give you a, a, a quick example just to kind of illustrate it. Um, <coughs> okay, so because this one, I, I do want to make these criteria not be too abstract. So uh, and this, this whole talk's part of like a bioethics lecture series, but I have lots of medical examples. So a woman develops a rare blood disorder uh, in my scenario, called paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> there is there was a, a medication that was developed for this a few years ago, and it is wickedly expensive. It works great, works reasonably well. It is wickedly expensive. 
thousands and thousands of dollars per dose. So she develops this disorder. It's a bad disorder. Um, now, she has saved up a bunch of money she, she had intended to give to her grandchildren so they could go to college. Now she's confronted with a decision. If I want to use this medicine, I have to use my savings because insurance only pays for a portion of it. So she, her, now she's confronted with a, an, an action that will have a double effect. It will preserve her health, but it will deny for her, children, her grandchildren uh, her hope for ability to help them go to college. So, can she do this? Can she, can she choose to do this medicine? So, is the action that she's doing morally good? Yes. What is the action that she's doing? She's treating her disease. Right. Is she intending only the good outcome? One hopes. <laughs> Assuming yes, then she's fine. Three, um, is the good outcome being accomplished by means of the bad outcome? No, it's not. So it's not that, I mean, whether her children go to college or not, her disease, I mean, her, she's still healthy. It's not like her children must miss college for her to become healthy. Does that make sense? So it's not by means of the evil that she accomplishes the good. And the last thing is the question of proportionality. Now, here's where prudential judgment comes in. I mean, she could decide, no, I'm, I'm going to pay for my grandkids to go to college. I'm going to suck it up, and this is my sacrifice for that. that. That's fine. That's legitimate. That is prudential judgment. Or she could say, yeah, yeah, I don't like paroxysmal. Um, I'm going to treat it, and that's fine too. So, so but, that, but that, that's the way I'm at. Does that make sense? I kind of illustrate it and make it helpful. Okay, good. Okay, so now let's go on to the last one. So the evaluation of the moral kind of an action that a person is doing. So this one's going to start out a little, not too abstract, but a little weird. Um, but I think it, this is very useful. So in the last two sections, uh, one may never use evil for good. We're talking about an evil kind of action. And in the, in the most recent one, in Principle of Double Effect, we're talking about using a good action to accomplish good and bad. But at the core of both of those is the action that the person is choosing. So that raises the question, what exactly is it that the person is choosing to do? What kind of an action is this? Is this an act of medical care? Is this an act of malice towards her grandchildren? Is this, what is it? What is it that the person's doing? So this turns out to be an important, as you might guess, thing to kind of think about a little bit. So I want to take you through some of this. And I'm going to make two points as we go through it, that, uh, which we'll get to. So the language of this, if you guys are interested in this and are reading about this, for this question of what is it that this person is doing, the language of moral theology calls this the object of the will or the object chosen, or sometimes just the object. So, and this comes from a, a conceptual framework for thinking about moral decision making. Um, the, the, the sources of the morality of what's called the human act. So there's the object chosen, the what of what you're doing, the circumstances, and your intention. So th those are sort of the three components. And, anyway. uh, so I'm going to pluck out of that just this notion of the object. Now, that word, I got so stumped on this word when I was trying to, to uh, learn all this stuff. I was like, oh, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's just weird. And it is a little weird. But it's the what of what you're doing. Now, the use of the word object is, it illustrates, I think, an interesting point. Because it, it draws forth this notion that in choosing to act, I am, it's almost like I'm selecting something. I'm, I'm going to my shelf of actions that I can choose from. And you're like, um, I'm like that. It's an object that I'm picking up to go perform. So it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. So here's an analogy for how to think about the what of what you're doing. Imagine that I have a dinner party for my neighbors. I invite our friends or whatever. I invite everybody over. Within the analogy, I have to choose an action. In my dinner party, I have to choose a food. I have to choose a food to serve my guests. Now, point number one. I can choose a good food. I can serve them glazed carrots, asparagus. I can serve them um, filet mignon with a, a peppercorn sauce. I used to cook back in the days. And those are good kinds of foods. I mean, as long as my guests are not So those are good <laughs> kinds of food. Or my friends are coming over, and well, you know, I could serve them some spoiled meat. 
I could serve them some mushrooms I found growing in the backyard. I could, you know, get some of that green stuff that's in my garden, but it's not the stuff I plant. I'm not sure what it is, but here I'll just put some salad dressing on it.